Good afternoon. It's great to be here. I'm Dave Kern, co-founder and CEO of 4D. I think everybody in this room understands the great potential of gene therapy, but the field has had a number of important hurdles that we've had to overcome, probably the greatest of which is the need for better vectors for in vivo gene delivery. And it's really this hurdle that 4D has been focused on overcoming. So our value proposition, we're a gene therapy company. Our transformative discovery platform is referred to as therapeutic vector evolution. And this allows us to create optimized and proprietary AAV vectors, which can be targeted to any cell or tissue in the body for the treatment of genetic diseases with high unmet medical needs. So this is the outline of my talk. I'll give you an overview on the company, then get a little bit into some data, some representative data on our vector discovery and characterization uh, pipeline, and then finish up with partnering and a few words on our internal product pipeline. Okay. So we were founded in 2014. Dave Schaefer is my co-founder. He's out of UC Berkeley, and he's really a pioneer in the uh, development of this technology of uh, using directed evolution to discover novel AV capsid vectors. Uh, with our platform, again, we are able to create and uh, optimize these proprietary vectors which overcome the hurdles with first generation AV vectors, which I'll speak to in a minute. Uh, this gives us a very strong composition of matter because what comes out of these screens is basically delivered by nature. It's not a rational design approach where we could be accused of having uh, obviousness issues. Um, we have uh, important partnerships because of the breadth of this platform. We can't do everything ourselves, so our, pa our partners are critical. We have partnerships with uh, Pfizer in the heart, Roche in the retina, uh, Benetech, AGTC, and Unicure. So we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, really leading partnerships. We also have important partnerships with nonprofit patient advocacy groups, which we f uh, feel are critical for our mission. We, uh, we have a, a strong program with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, Foundation Finding Blindness, and others. Uh, again, we have a diversified business portfolio, so we have partnership products as well as our own internal products. Our lead our IND candidates currently are in the retina, focused on rare monogenic diseases of the retina, with the first indication being uh, choroideremia. Uh, we brought in about $50 million to date in uh, equity, grants, and partnership income, and we're located in Emeryville, California, just down the road from UC Berkeley. So what are some of the uh, hurdles with the first-generation AAV vectors? And I think probably everyone in the room is familiar with these. So first of all, it's tissue targeting. Can we get vectors that are uh, really highly efficiently targeted for the uh, tissue of interest? Can we use the optimal delivery route? Can we get away from some of these quasi-surgical approaches such as subretinal injection required for AV use in the retina or you know, on the order of 50 to 70 intramuscular injections for muscle delivery? So again, can we get vectors that can be used by the optimal clinical route of administration? Uh, Pre-existing antibodies in the population can be an issue with AV, and this is again something our technology can overcome. We can uh, create vectors with resistance to those pre-existing antibodies in the population. And finally, we believe with more efficient vectors, we should be able to reduce uh, the required dosing and therefore reduce cost of goods, which is another issue for any novel biological platform such as AAV. So how does this therapeutic vector evolution work? Well, we apply the principles of evolution. Evolution really has two parts. One is generation of diversity, and the second is natural selection to identify the most fit uh, in a population. So we start with uh, AV1 through 10, the uh, wild type vectors that the rest of the field has been using uh, with uh, limited success, but some great recent successes in specific uh, diseases. And we create massive diversity around those. So using molecular biology techniques, we generate a library that's on the order of 100 million novel capsid variants. So it's, uh, you think about that, we have 10 million times more capsid variants to choose from, uh, from uh, compared to the rest of the field and where it stands today. Uh, and so from that, we can generate uh, libraries where each caps protein capsid is barcoded with its own genome inside, which takes a certain amount of uh, trade secret and uh, Dave Schaefer's worked out over, over the better part of a decade. Once we have this library, then we apply natural selection to force these vectors to do what we want them to do in the human body and identify the most fit for that purpose. 
So we do serial screening, and we, with those screens, we funnel down from 100 million down to a handful of vectors which are highly optimized for the particular uh, uh, use in, in humans. Importantly, all of our in vivo work we do in non-human primates. All of our ex vivo work we do in the best available primary human organotypic models and in human serum. Okay, so now we'll get into some examples of what we've been able to achieve with this platform. Uh, this is just a snapshot of 10 uh, discovery programs which have been uh, completed at the company. You can see in parentheses the number of individual capsid families in each of those areas that have been discovered. Uh, importantly, you can see we're going after a wide range of tissue targets and we're using a variety of different uh, delivery methods which are really optimized for the tissue target of interest. So for retina, it's intravitreal. For something like skeletal muscle or cardiac, it will be uh, intravenous. For brain, it might be intrathecal. So retina. So there's been tremendous progress in the retina with companies like Spark and Nightstar advancing the field with some great data using subretinal injection. So why is it that they're using subretinal injection instead of intravitreal injection, which is used for ILEA and Lucentis and is done many thousands of times a day? And the reason is that AAV is unable to traverse from the vitreous into the retina because of the inner limiting membrane, which blocks the vector from permeating through. So that's why they need to do the uh, subretinal injection, which is causing a transient retinal detachment and a bleb of fluid, which covers on the order of 5 to 10% of the retina on average. So um, can we evolve a vector to get around this problem and use a simple intravitreal injection and target the entire retina? So from that program, we were able to isolate 40 R100. This is a pan-retinal vector, which was evolved really to hit all the layers of the retina. You can see here some proof of concept data with GFP expression comparing 40R100 to AV2, which is currently the, the vector most commonly used in the retina. And we see a statistically significant uh, and important advantage for 40R100 over AV2 ex vivo in primary human RPE cells, which is the target cell for choroideremia. So this is strong proof of concept that what we evolve in a non-human primate crosses over into the best available human tissue. Now, obviously, ex vivo, you don't have a lot of the barriers that you have in vivo, so it was then important to take these vectors in vivo. This is what we saw when we moved in vivo. Some of this work was done with uh, David Sui and Benetech, as well as with Mark Sherman and uh, ADTC. Uh, but you can see here uh, the uh, expression level with a um, retinal imaging in life at two weeks uh, with a Heidelberg Spectralis camera just showing wherever you see white is expression of GFP in these animals uh, in vivo. So we saw very early widespread uh, expression of GFP, which was not previously seen with any of the wild type vectors that have been tested in non-human primates with intravitreal injection. By immunohistochemistry, we can see in the lower left, the RPE layer is staining uh, over 90% positive as well as the photoreceptor layer. So we were getting clearly uh, widespread uh, geographical distribution as well as uh, transduction of a, a number of important cell types, including photoreceptors and RPE cells. When we look at the fovea, we can see a high intensity uh, cone expression here. As you know, the fovea is important for reading and day-to-day and, uh, -day living, including driving, so this is important to see that we could hit the fovea with a simple intravitreal injection. This is a chronic GFP study where we took it out to six months. This is uh, an image at five months showing uh, continued high-level expression diffusely throughout the retina. Okay, so what about other methods of delivery? We've shown we can do this with intravitreal. Uh, how about lungs? So lung aerosolized deliveries felt to be the most important mechanism of delivery. Targeted genetics did some amazing work with cystic fibrosis with an AV2. Uh, unfortunately, the efficacy was suboptimal, and I think we can see here why that is. We can see a comparison here of luciferase expression from a lung organotypic model where we see 40A100 expressing at significantly higher levels across a wide, uh, wide uh, duration of time compared to AV5, 9, and 2. When a very similar virus was taken in vivo into the best available model for cystic fibrosis, which is a pig model at the uh, University of Iowa, we see here the untreated pig, no red staining for CFTR, but in the far right, we can see after an aerosolized delivery in this animal, we get nice penetration, good expression of CFTR, 
uh, throughout the airway of these animals. And this results in a correction of the ion channel uh, function defect in, in these cystic fibrosis pigs, as well as normal ciliary function. Just showing again that we can evolve a vector that now gets through that thickened mucus in the cystic fibrosis model and corrects the defect. What about muscle? This is a great target for gene therapy, but again, we need better vectors, especially with these high doses required for IV administration. This is data from 4DC101. This is a new variant we've recently discovered from uh, intravenous delivery to cardiomyocytes in non-human primates. When we take and put this now with GFP expression onto primary human ventricular cardiomyocytes, we see a high degree of expression here. You can see it's actually saturated at MOIs down to 200. We've now taken this down to MOIs of on the order of 50, and we're still getting 75% uh, transduction. You can see uh, below that AV1, which is used in the Celadon uh, trials uh, for heart failure, and then AV9 below that. So it does appear that what we've evolved in non-human primates, again, crosses to the human situation, the, again, in human ventricular cardiomyocytes. This is just a time course just showing how these vectors behave fundamentally differently from some other AAVs. We see a very rapid onset here. Those are just days one through five across the top for CD, uh, 40C101 versus AV1 and AV9. This is some preliminary skeletal muscle fiber data. These are Cook myocyte derived skeletal muscle fibers, and we're looking at a variety of MOIs here, a range of 50 to uh, 1,000, just showing superiority of 40C101 as compared to AV9. Uh, in these uh, muscle fibers. So again, these vectors now need to be taken back into non-human primates and, and prove the in vivo delivery as well. Okay. So that just uh, hopefully gives you a snapshot of the type of data that we're uh, generating with this novel therapeutic vector evolution platform. As I said, partnering is critical for us, and we're excited to have some great partners. We typically partner at the intersection of a transgene product of interest for our partners or a, a certain genetic target as well as uh, lead vectors that we've evolved uh, in many cases for specifically their needs and the cells that they'd like to target by a given route of administration. Again, as I said, we're proud to have Pfizer and Roche as, as partners in the uh, heart and retina, respectively. Uh, again, Unicure, AGTC, and Benetech are outstanding partners of ours, and you've seen David Tsui's uh, presentation just prior to this. And then, again, the Rare Disease Foundation, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, is funding all of our IND enabling work for the Cystic Fibrosis product. And, uh, again, we have uh, an important relationship with the foundation funding blindness as well. So I've told you a little bit about uh, the discovery and characterization of these vectors, our important partnerships, but what about our own internal pipeline? We've really elected to focus on rare monogenic diseases. Our, we, we feel that job one for us is really not only to benefit patients as quickly as possible, but also to validate our vectors and really validate the platform vectors and the approach in humans. So uh, this reflects that. So uh, choroideremia uh, is a defect in the REP1 gene. Um, this is a, a, a relentlessly uh, blinding disorder that starts in the teens with uh, d disease progression of the periphery of the retina and then a, a progressive march to the center and eventual blindness. Um, again, uh, Nightstar's made some great progress here with subretinal injection. We hope to be able to use an intravitreal administration here and come into patients much earlier in their disease progress, uh, progression. Uh, we're also looking at other inherited retinal diseases as well as large market uh, indications like wet AMD expressing anti-VEGF uh, factors. Uh, cystic fibrosis, as I said, uh, with aerosolized delivery, that's a, a next important uh, therapeutic area for us. And then we do see great potential in the heart and skeletal muscle with a focus on DMD as well as lysosomal storage diseases. So this is just one functional uh, data readout. This is for the choroideremia product. We uh, took, uh, on the far left, normal RPE cells. Uh, which we evolved in the lab. We can see REP1 is expressed, and the RAB27 target is at the periphery of the cells on the cell membrane, as it should be. In the middle, you can see RPE cells evolved from uh, pluripotent stem cells obtained from patients with choroideremia. No REP1 is present, and the RAB27 is diffuse in the cytoplasm. And at the far right, we can see with transduction with uh, 40R100 expressing REP1, uh, we see nice gene expression, and we now see that that RAB27 has gone back to the membrane where it belongs, 
and we can see the cellular phenotype has been uh, resolved and restored. So thank you very much for your attention. If we have time, we'll take any questions.